Hi, thank you Fashion Revolution for the invitation to speak with you today. My name is Benedict Casey and I'm one of the founders of the Formery, a textile research and development company. We've also been providing consulting services to the fashion industry for over a decade. Our current lead project is creating a circular economy for clothing onshore in New Zealand. It's called the Textile Reuse Program and it's a, it's a private public um, sector collaboration. So if you'd like to know more about that, jump onto textilereuse.com. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about what is happening in the fashion industry in New Zealand and globally. Um, the pandemic has caused a, a crisis within the industry. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of that and then where you as activists can shine your light to help the industry evolve because it shouldn't be an industry of, of suffering and destitution which is what we're seeing happen at the moment. And, um, and there's so much joy and creativity within, within the industry, so bringing your energy to it. Um, now is the perfect time for us to reshape the industry into, into something more just and fairer and, and beautiful. So um, thank you for joining me. I've got my laptop in front of me because there's some key metrics that I want to get right for you, so I'm just going to jump straight on in. Um, the humanitarian and financial crisis that is COVID-19 um, has left the fashion industry particularly exposed because, like the hospitality industry, it is dependent on um, discretionary spend and with people in lockdown and stores closed, um, the taps being turned off and the industry is in free fall. Uh, market analysis company McKinsey estimate that revenues for this for the global fashion industry um, will contract by about 30% this year, but it's also compounded by the last couple of years. So in 2018, they estimate that over 50% of fashion companies were not earning their cost of capital. So this is creating this sort of perfect storm, and, and they anticipate that a large number of of fashion brands will go into bankruptcy in the next 12 to 18 months. So um, the last couple of years the industry's faced um, a lot of criticism for the conspicuous overproduction. Um, we've seen companies like Burberry outed for the incineration of unsold stock. Obviously they're not the only, the only company that was doing it. But um, there was a really large backlash to that. So before the pandemic, it was um, estimated that the industry would require about 35% more land for the production of fibre. So that's 115 million more hectares, which is a deeply concerning figure for, um, for environment, environmentalists and other people in the industry. Um, now that figure is unlikely. Um, what we're seeing now is uh, because stores have been closed and in regions like New Zealand online sales have halted as well, we have seen a stockpile of on inventory. In the UK alone, um, their market, the fashion industry, about 80% of revenue comes from bricks and mortar stores and only about 20% 20, 20 from e-commerce. So there's a backlog of stock in warehouses. It's estimated to be about £10 billion um, backlogged. And now because uh, warehouses are reaching capacity, stock is ending up on imports um, just just stored there. So what we're going to see over the next sort of um, 12 months is uh, is heavy discounting as companies uh, attempt to clear their inventory and free up cash flow. But what McKinsey warns is that for companies that are engaging with a growing cohort of ethical and sustainability minded customers, that discounting and this traffic driving could be construed as being tone deaf to the market. The other thing we're going to see is um, in um, de-risking their supply chains, we're going to see more nearshoring or onshoring of production lines. 
and a rapid migration to e-commerce. So what we learnt from the global financial crash a decade ago, the sector of the market that came out, um, out of the crisis first was the designer and, and luxury market. We, and many customers look for those so-called investment pieces, the pieces, the, the, the garments that last forever and feel more responsible with the state of the world at the moment. So that mantra of fewer, better things that many of us have been advocating you know, for years. There's going to be an increased pressure on brands to validate their ethical and sustainability statements. Um, there's no part of the value chain that's immune to what's happening, but because of the value, uh, because of the power imbalances within the supply chain, it is the garment workers that have been hit the hardest and, and are feeling the effects most. According to fashion commentator and author Tansy Hoskins, she says that the global economy has been set up so you have a certain number of countries in the global south that have been invited into the economy on the basis that they maintain very low waged workforce and they maintain themselves as garment producing companies and she calls it a, a warped invitation. But as a result of this, we've seen some countries overexposed to the garment market. Bangladesh, about 80% of the exports come from clothing. Sri Lanka, Cambodia, um, clothing accounts for about 50% of the exports. Um, with the lockdown and the closure of store, uh, stores and e-commerce platforms, brands are cancelling their orders and this is leaving factories and their workers in, in dire straits. Some countries like India and Sri Lanka, the lockdown or the curfew is enforced by the police or the military so workers can't go into the factories even if they want to for threat of um, well, the repercussions of leaving their homes. Uh, India has extended its lockdown to the 3rd of May, although I did read yesterday that some of the export sectors um, and industries are now exempt. But what this has done is shine the light on, on how precarious the garment work to, workers are in these countries. They still hold no power within the industry and are extremely vulnerable. And as a result, um, there's a humanitarian crisis for millions and millions of garment workers. So human rights observers, activists and factories themselves are asking for brands to step up and do the right thing. They're saying if brands are going to base their supply chain in countries to take advantage of the low wage production and where they know that there is no social safety net um, for their workers then they have to take responsibility when things go wrong. So in response we've seen campaigns like um, Pay Up which is raising awareness and putting pressure on brands to pay for orders and they estimate that about $3 billion worth of orders have been either cancelled or paused. Kim van der Weerd from, he's a former uh, general manager of a Cambodian garment factory, he's challenging customers to demand to know whether brands are supporting their factories with payroll financing in the absence of orders and asking when brands um, attack their sustainability credentials that customers demand to see their policies on purchasing. So um, as activists, we can shine your light. Um, last year, a group of a group called the Union of Concerned Researchers in Fashion formed, and they've recently um, suggested four focus areas within the value chain, which um, which you may like to support as well. So uh, in no particular order, number one, modern slavery, living wage, and women's empowerment. These concerned researchers are asking companies to, di to disclose their post-pandemic plans for long-term and permanent structural change in the fashion industry so that supply chain workers are never put in this precarious position again. Number two is circularity in the fashion industry. Um, the term circularity is used liberally and usually incorrectly within the industry. Um, and the Union of Concerned Researchers is suggesting that um, 
that we require a true system change and would like to see where no product is brought to the market unless it's connected to a very viable circular or take back system from the very outset. Number three is traceability, so disclosing to the public what areas um, of the supply chain is fully transparent, what percentage remains opaque, so that uh, so the public can understand what, what real gains have been met and where the challenges are. And finally, uh, in re-commerce, repair and rental, um, Front-footed brands are starting to offer um, mending services, which is, kind of, which is acknowledging customers' restricted cash flow and building on their sustainability and, and ethical um, positioning. It also enhances the value perception of the garment, that it's of such good quality that it's worth repairing. Concerned researchers want, would like brands to take that further step and to explain how um, the resale or repair of these garments is, is linked to a reduction in the consumption of virgin, um, in virgin products. So there are four um, key focus areas that you might want to look at and lend your support to. Um, the next few months are going to be a fight for survival for many fashion brands. But for garments workers, it's a fight for their life as well. And I'd like to thank Fashion Revolution for their ongoing, ongoing um, support uh, of the of garment workers who are the most vulnerable within within the industry. Um, thank you for the work that you do, and. Um, you know, we need you more than ever right now. I'd also like to thank everyone who's tuned in. Um, keep well, keep safe and keep up the good work. Thank you.